Welcome back. Um, first yeah. meeting since um, since November last year. Um, thank you, Peter, for agreeing to tonight. So this talk had been agreed. Uh, this talk had been agreed to happen. We were trying to the month before lockdown. Um, we were sitting down in the pub and we were hearing about the coronavirus that was in China and you know debating as to what it might do beyond China and uh, the next month we were in lockdown it was uh, it all happened very very quick so that was the month that Peter was due to be giving the talk when all this sort of kicked off so it's fantastic that we can uh, finally catch up and and hear all about the iguanas um, uh, Peter was meant to be prawning tonight so uh, he'd been up at Miles Lakes to uh, to catch prawn so appreciate you uh, yeah foregoing the prawning to be here um, on the weekend, Smith Slate's field trip happened. Um, Frank, our field trip coordinator, do you want to give us a rundown on how that all went? Uh, we didn't see too much. Diversity was pretty low, although the uh, conditions looked quite nice. Uh, the nicest thing we got to see was a nice big uh, adder, about 60 centimetres. Uh, there was one roughly a big one also that managed to get away. Nobody uh, was around to, uh, to actually catch it, to actually was allowed to catch it, so uh, only some people got to see that one. And then the usual stuff, the golden crowns, the small eyes, the pythons. Uh, anything else? That's probably it, I guess. No calls this year. How many, how many members went? Or how many people? Uh, 14 attended? at the end. Two 14. people pulled out because of COVID. But there were 14, which was a nice number. Yeah, okay. Um, for those of you that haven't been to Smith's Lake, so yeah, you've got to go. It, uh, the facilities, it's not, it's glamping, it's not camping, it's, there's kitchens, there's, there's um, beds, it's all very gentrified, but um, you're still seeing a, a whole lot of stuff. So if you can, please go. Um, I'm sort of limiting, what, what I've done in previous years is booking all of the talks for the year and then feel like I've done a good job. But what would eventually, or what would inevitably happen is you'd have these opportunities to give better presentations during the year when opportunities arise. So I'm trying not to get too ahead of myself. So, um, so far we've got June booked where uh, Chris Jolly, uh, Stuart McDonald, and who was the third author for Rick, do you know? No, okay. Reptiles of the Northern Territory will be released um, uh, mid-June. We'll be having a book launch here at the end of June. Um, so uh, there'll be plenty of more information released on that as we get closer. Um, mm. So save that date. Uh, next month, um, Michelle Bingley, Michelle Darley, uh, I'm not sure her married name to her pre-married name, but anyway, she's a vet out in uh, Western Sydney. She's gonna be coming in and doing autopsies for us. So we'll have a table set up here. We've got um, a big olive, we've got a big black-headed python and a goanna so far, so we'll, uh, we'll have everyone gathering around and Michelle's gonna chop them up and show us what we're all looking at while, uh, while the autopsies happen. So uh, beyond those two meetings, I'm not being slack, I'm just trying to keep my powder dry. Um, now, we cleaning up the new website and, and looking at old websites and looking at old email addresses and all this sort of stuff, we've, put together about eight and a half thousand email addresses that we were able to blast out to everyone. And it seems that everyone who comes to meetings still aren't getting emailed. How many people here, show of hands please, received the emails that we've sent out twice this month? Less than half. <laughs> so um, there's the members book over there. Uh, please put your email address in the members book and we'll try and make sure that all the members are, are getting it. And how many people received the latest edition of the Red Belly Courier? Less than half, okay. So, yeah, clearly there's still a problem. Um, so do what you can to help us out. Um, if we've got your details, we're sending out these emails, letting you know that, that the, uh, the magazines are being sent out or meetings are occurring. So um, we used to have the members book having members and non-members and just getting you to put your name in, um, which seemed kind of irrelevant where most people were members. So um, there's a space there to put your email address. Please do so and we'll try and keep you in the loop with what's going on. Um, I think that's about it for now. Um, 
Uh, Simon Paps is over from the UK. Simon is responsible for green lighting the production of the two AHS books that uh, have been produced thus far. Uh, he approved Urban Reptiles, which we keep promising him is going to be uh, in the post shortly. So uh, Simon's down here, so say hello to him if you do get the chance. Uh, great to see so many of you here, and uh, without any further ado, I'll hand over to Peter to talk about Fiji and Iguanas. Put your hands together for Peter. Yeah, yeah thanks Chris, and uh, thanks for holding the society together during COVID. It uh, looked pretty bad there for a while. Uh, tonight I'm just going to talk about a little project I'm doing at the moment, but I want to give a lot of background too, not just this project is pretty short, it's just about planting trees on an island. But So I'm going to give a lot of background about Fiji and iguanas, uh, why they're in Fiji, what they're like, how many species, stuff like that. So I, I guess being reptile people, you all know that iguanas are herbivorous. They, they eat plants, they eat leaves, flowers, fruits and things. And a lot of them are very fructivorous. That is, they basically live on fruit, cactus fruit in the new world. And if you look at their world distribution, uh, you'll find there's, there's eight genera within that family of true iguanas. A lot of things are called iguanas, but they're not. And there's the Galapagos iguanas, of course, which everyone's aware of. There's two, two different genera there. And then the Caribbean has its own distinctive genera of, of uh, iguanas. And there's desert iguanas in the US. And, but you'll see the trend, there's seven genera right there. You'll see the trend is they're all in the New World and they're all in the tropics. Uh, green iguanas get down into South America. And then you've got this one group of iguanas way over the other side in the Pacific, off North Queensland almost, you know? So biogeographically, it's a, it's a real mystery. No one really can, can say how they got there. But uh, one of the theories is that the oldest known fossils are found in the Gobi Desert in China of iguana type animals. So it seems most likely that they evolved there about 50, 40 to 50 million years ago and then moved across the Bering Straits uh, when it was a much different climate into Central South America. But then that doesn't explain the Fijian connection. But uh, the best, the best uh, suggestion that we have is that they rafted across the Pacific, that is, Gravid females or a small bunch of them got on a, a, a bunch of floating logs and basically floated across the Pacific. And uh, 30 million years ago, when they probably turned up in the Pacific, in, South, in Fiji, Fiji was a lot closer. It was in the middle of the Pacific in those days, so it was a lot closer to South America. So as far as we know, they're probably one of the longest uh, uh, water dispersed uh, non-swimming vertebrates in the world. I mean, it's possible they came down through China, Southeast Asia, but there's no fossil evidence, and there's certainly no, no uh, suggestion that there's any, any iguanids in Asia. So we really don't know how they got to Fiji, but Fiji has never been connected to a landmass. came out of the ocean about 28 million years ago as a, vol as a bunch of volcanoes. So everything that lives in Fiji either swum or flew or floated there. So there's no land animals except rats, which came with humans about 3,000 years ago. So it's birds, bats, and uh, and plants really, and quite a few quite a few uh, reptiles made the journey. Skinks and skinks, geckos, one lappet snake, one uh, blind snake, and then the iguanas. <coughs> so this is the Fiji Islands. Most of you are probably a bit familiar with it. Two really big islands, half a dozen medium-sized islands, and about two, over 200 little islands, and. Uh, so people have been, naturalists have been going through the Pacific for many centuries. And these are some of the old uh, paintings that some of the early uh, collectors had of, of, of the uh, Fiji iguanas. Most of these were actually, originally it was described from a specimen in, in uh, Tonga. So they're well represented in some of the early expedition uh, artworks. And this is an interesting one because this is Gunther's painting from 1860. Too. And the British Museum has still got the same lizard, so you can see the uh, you can see the little, this little speck here, uh, same guy. So he's been relaxing in uh, alcohol for 150 years, and he's still in the museum collection. So 
there's been a lot of interest in biological control circles about iguanas and for a while they weren't sure they were true iguanas and they've been changed around quite a bit different families but they are definitely true iguanas. This is an interesting one because it's from the second biggest island in Fiji, Vanuatu, and it was collected, it's the only one known, in 1887. And uh, so what you say, but then in 1883, mongoose were introduced to the two big islands in Fiji and immediately they all went extinct. So there's no, no iguanas on any of the big islands where there's mongoose. <clears throat> because the British introduced mongoose for uh, get, killing rats and snakes in the cane fields. Because the snakes are harmless, there's only a Pacific boa in Fiji, but people are scared of snakes. So they brought mongoose in and on every island the mongoose has got to, iguanas disappeared within about a year or two. I mean, they're gone, they're extinct. <clears throat> so I'll run through the species that we know, what, which we know of at the moment. The first one, this is a small, a small species, but I've surveyed about 90 islands there in Fiji and there's huge clines from the east to the west. This guy, that's my thumb underneath that uh, female there. And so they're, they're full grown adults and they're about, about uh, they're tiny, they're really little, little tiny ones. But the same species gets bigger on other islands, there's a huge climb. But uh, Fasciatus is the, the eastern one, it's also found in Tonga. But we know, now know that the Tongan ones were brought across by early traders, as, probably as a food item. So they didn't uh, occur naturally in Tonga, but this species is there now. And that's just a photo of one you'd uh, stuck on a log for a photo because you never see them on logs. They're always up in the treetops, they're always impossible to see. And they're so well camouflaged, there's no point looking in the daytime. But we stuck that one on the wall for the photo. And they do stand out on the wall because they're such bright emerald green. So that species is found in all those eastern islands. I've included the big island there, but that's only because they're found on the offshore islands. They're not found on the big island because of mongoose. Uh, Brachylopus bulbula is at the southern one. It's a much bigger band of iguana, and it's found on all those offshore islands there. And in 2017, we, we described a new species because it was significantly different to everything else on one island, the island of now. So that's that, whoops, that's that tiny little island in the middle there. So depending on what you call a species, there's possibly a lot more species in Fiji, but that one was very different to the surrounding islands. And then this is the, the big western iguana, the, the so-called uh, crested iguana, the one I've done most of my work on. And it's found on the, all the small islands in the far west of Fiji. But again, not on big islands because it's only on the uh, mongoose free islands. So this is a this is way out of date, but uh, this is a, a diagram. The red circles are extinct populations, and the black circles are currently known populations. <clears throat> but even some of those black spots, I mean, I know one of those black spots. There's one lizard on that island because there's only three trees left and there's one lizard in it, so it, that was 10 years ago. So it's probably extinct, so a lot of that information is out of date. But you can see there's more extinct populations than there are extant ones in Fiji. And they're still declining at the same rate, nothing's stopped the, the decline. So in the 1970s, there was a British biologist, John Gibbons, and he was working in Fiji, and he was a crazy herpetologist and spent all his time looking for iguanas. And he didn't find many, he spent years, and he found like three islands with iguanas. But everyone told him to go to Yandua Island, because there were iguanas there, that was the myth of the time. And when he did get there, he found this large crested iguana, a new species, which he described. And then he also got funding to get and make the island a national park. It was Fiji's first national park. And that's actually one of his photos. Uh, and you can see the island has got lots of grassland on top, because at the time it was, it had goats on it and they were burning the forest. So I think they're the last two photos of, uh, of John Gibbons. I don't think there's any others in existence, but uh, I had to put them in. And he published it as a description in 1981, I think. And that's the, the creature there. And that's their colour change to a happy green one and a, and a dark brown, black one. If you, if you poke them for a minute or two, they get dark and nasty and change their colour very, fairly quickly. Not, not too fast, but uh, yeah. So today, that's the island, that's a big island for the bottom. Viti Levu, the main island in Fiji. And Yandu Atumba is right up the top and it's a tiny little island off, uh, off uninhabited, off an inhabited island. But uh, that species, the banded iguana, is only found on those seven or eight islands. And like I say, that island at the top, Devi Lao, last time I was there, there was one iguana on it, so I'm sure it's died of old age. 
So a lot of those islands are very, very uh, small and declining populations. So that's uh, all the islands that do have iguanas. Uh, I'm only talking about the two red islands tonight because they're the ones I've, I've worked on for some years, Jungle Atumba and Monoriki. So, and yeah, they're all small islands. Uh, most of them are uninhabited and none of them have cats or mongoose on them. So, Yungo Atumba is the sanctuary island and for some reason it's got, it's like, it has an um, unbelievable population of iguanas there. And it's because the vegetation is, is really in good condition. It's native Fijian dry forest. It's got all the, all, the, all the trees that the iguanas eat the leaves and the fruit and the flowers of. So, so in 2005, we began a market capture. Myself and a, a group of people, that's uh, Susan Morrison. She's a PhD student from ANU who did a PhD over there. And we, she started a market capture on a 50 by 50 meter area. Like, like this room is 20 by 20 meters. So you're talking an area three times as big as this room, maybe, and it's tiny little forest. But, but we marked every tree. There were 606 trees. We put so we put numbers on them, and we put pit tags in every one. Or she did. She started that in 2005, and that's the the dry forest. It's very open. It's got small, mostly small trees. Uh, yeah, like that's that's and it's rocky habitat. But it's it's absolutely ideal for the iguanas, and there's huge numbers there. So we put we put a uh, number tag on every tree. So when we catch an iguana, we, we know which tree it was in, and uh, we mark them and we put them back in the same tree at the same time. So we worked out very early on that you if you're going to walk through, you're going to look for PG iguanas. You don't bother looking in the daytime. You can't see them. They're in, they're basically invisible. I mean, even the Fijians who live there have. They might see one and there's six or eight in a tree, but they might see one and I'll see none because they're impossible to see. So we started going out at night with really powerful spotlights. And uh, see, that's, that one was so obvious, I took a photo, but then uh, no one could see it in the photographs though. But in the middle there, there's an iguana. But uh, and that's about as obvious as you'll ever see in the daytime. So we go out at night with bright lights and they always sleep out on the end of branches, uh, very exposed, and their bellies are very reflective. You can see them 50, 60 metres away. They're reflecting from the, their bellies in the forest at night. So we do everything, all our catching and all our uh, marking and everything at night. And we have these telescoping, telescoping fishing poles, which make it really easy because what you do, you tie a bit of, uh, on the, the very end, you put a big pad of coconut fibre and you just jam it into the lizard's belly and it grabs onto the coconut pod and then you bring it down and it sits there. So it's really easy to catch and you can catch every iguana in an area very quickly. So this is the this is the sanctuary island where there's thousands and they just sit on the pole and you take them off and let them go again. And then we put a bit of blue dye, a bit of a blue pentel pen on their belly so we don't catch them again the same night or the same trip. So this is uh, that small uh, 20.25 hectare forest site over 13 years. You've got to know this island was burnt and uh, goat grazed for, for 30, 40 years. We got the last goats off just before this started. So 2003, we got the last goats off. And it hasn't been burnt since the 80s. So the forest is still recovering. It's getting, the trees are getting higher, they're getting bushier. Uh, the understory is growing. So the, the habitat's getting better all the time. And you can see back in 2006, the population was about 120, and now it's at well over 300. So, and it'll keep growing until the forest matures, which is probably another 20 or 30 years. So the population density is crazy. There's, we're getting 300 and something iguanas in 600 little trees. And these are, these are little trees. They're about as thick as your, your leg and four or five meters high. So there's one in every second tree. And they're just, and they're very philopatric. They stay in the same tree year on, year out. I've got the same iguana in the same tree 10 years later. So they don't even move between trees. They just eat the leaves and the shoots and the flowers of a particular tree. Yeah. And there's some, this is the same island, just a few uh, estimates over the years. Of, um, so back in the 70s, when the island was still burnt and the forest was in really bad condition, the guy who discovered them, he thought there was about 300 on the island. And there probably wasn't much more than that. But uh, the last survey we've done was, there's got to be over 
over 18,000, or probably 15,000 or more at the moment. So it's the only island that has this incredible super dense population. So in 2006, 2008, there was a bunch of us got together. Claire Morrison was an Australian biologist who was doing a postdoc in Fiji. And then my, my student, Susie Morrison, and then a whole bunch of, of uh, local Fijians who were at the time postgrad students. And now most of them are, uh, the woman there's a lecturer at the university. The guy on the right runs uh, uh, Conservation International in Fiji. So all of them have got really high powered jobs in conservation now, but at the time they were all just students and they used to come along as volunteers. So that was really good that uh, the keen ones all got really good jobs. But uh, we realised at that time we didn't know what they ate, we didn't know, no one had ever recorded nesting or grounded females or we didn't know what time of year they bred, we didn't know what they ate, we didn't know anything about them. So we started this combined project and uh, we, we looked at, so first we wanted to look at diet because we want to uh, translocate to other islands, we have to know what they're eating. So we, we, we got uh, fecal, fecal uh, poos from what, 300 iguanas and went through them microscopically and identified leaves and fruit and seeds. So now we have a really good understanding exactly what their preferred species are. We did that over a year, so at different times, different seasons. And yeah, the most important food species is this tree called sadua, with, or thadua, which is just, uh, it's in the coffee family. So it's a big fruit with, with a couple of seeds in it. And about 66, 62% of iguanas have that in their, in their scats. So uh, we realise that's the most important one, and that's a tree I'll talk about later on. But we worked out exactly what they eat, and of the 150 trees in the forest, they eat about 20 or 25 at the most leaves fruit. And we didn't know anything about their nest, their breeding ecology. So, because I had, any, I, people had only been there in the dry season, so we went in the middle of the wet season and we we uh, followed gravid females and found nests and put in temperature data loggers and got some nesting uh, nesting data. And the interesting thing is, even though they're iguanas, iguanas typically nest in hot sunny areas with, with full sun, but these guys nest in the coldest, dampest, deepest uh, shady areas they can find in the forest. So way colder than any, than, uh, than ambient temperatures. And they have the longest, one of the longest incubation periods, like eight and a half months the eggs are in the ground. So it's very, it's up there with two Ataris and, and lace monitors as far as how long the incubation period is. So, and we also looked at spatial ecology and because we, it didn't make sense how, there were so many overlapping uh, home ranges, but they're not particularly, uh, uh, they, there's not a lot of male combat, but there's, you've got to imagine it's, it's a tree, so it's a three dimensional, it's a three-dimensional uh, habitat that they live in, in territory, so they have three-dimensional habitats. But it's, yeah, it's very, very complex how they uh, all get along during the breeding season. This. So and other things we learned, the age cohorts are really clear. All the hatchlings occur in November, and so there's a, a one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old, and a four-year-old there, and they're really quite clear and easy to, to age when you first catch them. So. Go back to the other island now, Monoriki, which is way south of, uh, of that island. And I first went there in 1998. It's, I, I, was, I was working in Fiji, actually. I was working with, with Sohan, who was who were, uh, a student of Rich Shines there, who was working on uh, sea snakes. So at the end of my trip, I did a trip out to this island because Steve Irwin and Terry had been there a few years before, and they said, said that this island had no iguanas. They spent two weeks there and they saw two, so they thought, they're supposed to have a lot of iguanas, that was the rumour, but they couldn't, they could find two after two weeks, so I went out there to have a look and uh, do a survey with, with my Fijian friend, who was the uh, ranger of the other uh, national park at Yanduatumba. So that's Monoriki Island, and the one next to it's Monu, and uh, it's owned by a traditional, a traditional Fijian clan who live on this island here. There's a village, there's a village there. And uh, they own the island, so it's theirs. And in Fiji, I think 87% of the land is owned by traditional Fijian clans. That is, everybody in the village that owns that island has, is a shareholder in the island. So, so before you do any of this stuff, you have to go there and get permission from the chief. So I've been doing that for a long time. I bought him some Cuban cigars last month. He's very happy. Uh, so yeah, you might know Monoriki because. Uh, uh, that's where they filmed uh, Castaway, uh, the movie Castaway. 
And uh, it's also, it's where they film American Survivor these days. So they have, uh, they started last week. So from February to June every year, all the Survivor people go there and they, they live on, on the next island, which is Mana, which has a big hotel. And they put the, how many, I never watched it. Is it what, 12 people they stick there? They stick 12 people on the island, they have to compete. And uh, so they, so the people own the, the chief owns the island, rents it to the me. Doesn't get a lot of money. It's only twenty or thirty thousand dollars a year he gets for the whole island. But, but uh, the interesting thing is, you have to all the all the field staff are on the next island. The people who do all the camera work and the props and everything. How many staff do you reckon they have in Fiji? This is just in Fiji, not post production people. They have six hundred staff on the next island just for this twelve guys and girls who do this survivor thing. Yeah. So they have 600 staff. They, it's the biggest hotel in Fiji on Mana Island and they rent it and they also rent other resorts. Because of course there's 600 people there just filming this show, yeah. So, but they've been very, they've been very uh, generous to me. They've lent me their boats and stuff, so that's very useful. But the, the rest of the year the island is uninhabited. So that's my first trip there in 1998. And we surveyed, it's a pretty rocky island, it's a lot of climbing and stuff. But at the time, in 1998, when I didn't have a great beard, completely. But at the time, it was uh, heavily overgrazed. So uh, they had, for 50 years, they had uh, at least three or 400 goats on that island. And they burned the forest every year because they, that encourages the grass, gets rid of the forest, encourage, encourages the grassland. And so they were burning the forest and, and they were overgrazing it. I mean, the goats were dying of starvation because there were so many overgrazed. There. So it was so overgrazed. And so all the edible seed, what happens when you burn a dry forest in the tropics, the trees are fire sensitive, so they'll die. But that's not a big problem because there's seeds in the seedbed in the ground and, and next time it rains, they will come up. But if you've got fire and goats, then the goats eat every seedling that comes up that's edible. Uh, the big tree behind me, that's, that's Val. It's, uh, it's got white toxic latex and it's poisonous, nothing can eat it. So that's why that's, the whole island is covered in that tree because it's really toxic and even a starving goat can't eat it. And so all the, all the native soft uh, foliage trees and, and vines and ground uh, forbs and all these things that iguanas would normally eat disappear if you've got goats and fire on the island. And that had been happening for 50 years. So, so uh, we did find a, a small patch with some iguanas in it back in 2000, 1998. And we did some vegetation surveys too, because that's the only seedlings in the, on the whole island were that toxic, poisonous species. The reason I put this photo in is for the background because that's the forest, that's the coastal forest there. And you can see behind Peter, uh, you can see that it's just sand. And that's the same, well, okay, and there too. That's the background there is actually uh, the forest. That's not the beach, that's the forest at the back there, that sand. And in, uh, so I'll show you some other photos soon of, of today. So we spent a a week or so on the island and we we did transects in 1998 and we got a few iguanas but then we went back in 2000 and did the same transects and uh, the numbers of iguanas have dropped quite steeply and then in 2003 we did much more surveys we basically surveyed 80 percent of the trees on the island and uh, because it was clear that there was, was no reproduction there were no young iguanas they were just old iguanas and they were getting fewer and fewer. So, so we, in 98, we thought there were maybe 100, and then by 2003, we thought there were somewhere around 30. So the population was declining just from old age and no recruitment. So we, we applied for funding, and we tried, we tried to talk the owners to taking the goats off the island. And, and they, after a few years, like they started to think about it. But in 2010, we got funding to uh, to start a captive breeding project for iguanas from the island. It took two years to catch 21 iguanas for a captive breeding project. project. And uh, they were put in a special uh, iguana quarantine breeding centre at Kuliga Park, a small, a small conservation park in Fiji. And they kept them there for about six years and, and they bred many, many of them, which is good. And that's uh, Robert Johnson, who some of you know, is a reptile that he came across with us several times to, during this project. So 
after we got all these uh, iguanas in captivity and got funding for the whole project, the year later the owners of the island said, oh yeah, we'll take the goats off now. So it, we only took the iguanas off because we thought there would be another decade or two before we could convince them to take the, to take the uh, goats off and the rats. So BirdLife International got funding to get rid of that, rats and, uh, and goats because it's also an important uh, shearwater nesting area. There's about 5,000 pair of uh, uh, wedge-tailed shearwaters nest on that island every year. So yeah, 2011 was a big year. They got rid of goats and rat rats the same year. And that's not Fiji, that's just a tree in, in the Middle East to show you what goats can do. Because they, they can climb trees. I've seen them up trees. And so if the tree has edible foliage, they, they can climb it. But that's somewhere in the Middle East. Great photo though. So yeah, in 2015 we released all the captive bred iguanas back on Monoriki because the vegetation had recovered. It looked like it really had recovered. It was everywhere was green and and and, and thick. But uh, so this is one particular iguana. There's not a lot of these. This one was born in captivity in 2013, and we released it in 2015, and we recaptured it in in 2018. So some of the captive ones did survive and and reproduce. Uh, but basically not as many as we hoped. There was uh, not, we didn't catch a lot of recaptures. Of the 60 we released after a year or two, we only got six or eight or 10, no more than 10. So there was high mortality of the captive bred ones. And uh, so in 2016, we did, we did really thorough iguana and vegetation surveys. Again, just to see how many iguanas were there. And that's our botanist. I'm this guy I'm working with again today. So that's the photo I want to show you. That's the, the background there is the same as there. But this is 10 years after you removed the goats. And you think, oh, that looks great. And iguana would love to be there. But actually, it's, again, it's all this, uh, all those trees are that, that vale tree, which is a toxic tree, which iguanas can't eat. And all the, the uh, runners on the ground are introduced vines that iguanas don't eat anyway. So it looks perfect for a vegetarian, but it's not good for iguanas because there's, there's almost nothing there they can eat. And that became really clear. So this is Castle Bay Island. It's a tourist resort, 16 kilometres away, and it's it's owned by a local uh, another uh, landowning clan on the next island, of Mana, uh, no, uh, Malola. Anyway, but it's never been burnt. As far as we know, there's been no fires there in at least 100 years, and it doesn't. It's got a few goats, but it hasn't been grazed at all. So it's got a really. It's got the only. There's 30 islands in the Mana. Mama Nutha group, and this is the only one that has any native, any degree of native vegetation left. So that's the Mama Nutha Islands, just looking up, up, up the chain of islands, and every one of them has either been overgrazed, burnt, or completely, mostly, most of them have no trees at all, just grassland or invasive uh, Central American trees and scrub. So that's some of the some of the uh, Mama Nutha Islands, and. Monoriki up here and uh, Castle Bay down there, about, about, about 16 kilometres apart they are. So you may well ask, but surely you know these all these islands are being vegetated by by natural natural uh, processes in the past, and that's true. Like uh, pigeons are a really big seed disperser, but we never see pigeons. I mean, we see pigeons on Castaway, but we never see pigeons on Monoriki because there's no there's no fruiting trees there. So I've never seen a pigeon there, so the chances of one crapping out a seed 16 kilometres away to an island that never goes to is very, very remote. And uh, things like bats, there are enough. There's a, quite a few fruit bats in Fiji, but again, they only they only pass very small seeds, one, two, three millimetres, I think it is, come out in the faeces. And the only other way they can they can dis, dis, uh, disperse seeds is by carrying them in their mouth. And so the really small, there's one species of tree which has got really small seeds and like some of the figs. And they're, they're coming back on Monoriki because the bats are spreading the seeds. But most of the medium and large size seeds, the bats don't carry in their mouth for 16 kilometres and drop. So, I mean, if you had a million years, you'd probably get all these species would come back eventually to Monoriki from the other islands. But we're just trying to, to increase that, uh, the chances of those trees getting there by actually moving them. And we did a, an experiment with the iguanas, a big, a big speed dis seed dispersers too. 60% uh, of the favua seeds we fed to the iguanas 
and we took out of their crap, uh, they all germinate. So about 60% of the, the fruit they eat will have viable seeds. So they're the three big seed dispersers, but uh, of course iguanas don't go island to island, and, and the birds very rarely, and bats only, only distribute very small seeds. So, so that's the island of Castaway. And luckily for me, the, the, uh, the management of the resort liked me because I got rid of all their cats for them back in 2020 when I was supposed to be giving a talk here. So I convinced them to get rid of their cats, so they put me up for a couple of weeks and I trapped 56 cats off their island. They've also got a small colony of shearwaters there too, but there was mostly catty ones. So anyway, I got all their cats off their island, so they, they feel they owe me a favour, so now they put me up when I go there to collect seeds and, uh, and, and seedlings, which is very nice. Because you can rent these little bungalows, very nice, like lots of... <laughs> this area of the Marmaduke is, I don't know if you know about it, but there's at least 16 tourist resorts there, and they start at like $1,000 a day or something, and they go up to whatever you want. So crazy, crazy. So with the whole industry in that, all those islands is, uh, is tourism. So the two islands we're talking about, Monoriki, the one that, which was Burt and Gategrace and Castaway, you can see that my botanist friends have been there and come up with this list, and you can see that uh, Castaway has 142 uh, different plant species, whereas Monoriki only has 84. And the 84 it has are um, mostly inedible things because the goats would have cleaned them up 50 years ago. So there's a huge difference between the, the vegetation on these two islands. And by the way, so I didn't mention that Castaway Island has no, has no iguanas, even though it's got the best iguana vegetation in that, all that area, it has no iguanas. So, so we're hoping to reintroduce some there in the future. So the first, the most important, uh, it seems to me that iguanas are fruitiferous if they get the chance. They prefer to eat fruit than leaves. The leaves will sustain them, but fruit is where they get their, all their protein and their fats and stuff from. And after a good fruiting year, all the females will breed. Whereas it's, if it's a drought year, females won't breed because they're just not getting enough nutrients out of the leaves, I think. So these three species in red at the bottom, the sandalwood, the limeberry, and the Pacific jasmine, One's a tree and two are shrubs, bushes. And that's about, they're found in about 88% of the iguanas uh, droppings that we looked at. So they're the three really important fruiting, fruiting species of tree that we wanted to, to, uh, to move across the Mamariki. But uh, that's, uh, that's the sandalwood. And when they're ripe, the iguanas just gorge themselves. They just eat, they're ripe for the whole wet season, four or five months of the year, there's ripe fruit coming through. So the iguanas just eat them the fruit uh, those four or five months and put on weight. So we, especially, we, we concentrated on this species, the, the false sandalwood or Savoa. And we, I'm working with a local NGO who work with, with all the villagers there. So we collected lots and lots of seeds of those. And this is the limeberry, another one that has the chiguanas really like. But we couldn't, we couldn't, they didn't seed this year for some reason, so we didn't get any. So. And the, and the Pacific jasmine, which is another fruiting shrub, which we, were, which we want to introduce, but uh, we haven't done that. So last year, March, April last year, I was over there collecting lots of seedlings. These are sandalwood seedlings in the forest. And uh, just transplanting them, putting them in pots, basically. And I had a volunteer, Melbourne zookeeper, Rory, he uh, came with me. So, so we got lots of seedlings and potted them. This was back in March last year. And we left about 200 in the, uh, in the resort nursery for the resort uh, gardeners to look after. And then the other 200 or so, we, we trucked across to the, to the uh, island of the people who own Monoriki. And uh, the, man, the guy I work with there is the, he's the honorary ranger. He's sort of the, the, the chief's go-to man. When it comes to the island, he's the guy you go with. And, so he's got his own greenhouse and he's really keen to, to, to restore the island too. So I'm working mostly with this, this guy, Jabba, and that's his greenhouse in his village. So the other 200 seedlings we gave to him and he looked after them for, uh, until December when we went back to plant them. Uh, that's his greenhouse in the village. <coughs> Excuse me. So in December 2000, just last month or so, we, I went back there, and the bottom there is the, uh, is the, the, the rainfall for that area. That's actually from Nandy because there's no rain gauges anywhere where I go. But uh, 
but you can see January, February, March is big, the big wet season. So we go in December just to plant stuff and then by giving three months in the ground to get the roots going and stuff. So the time to plant things is definitely December. So we planted about 200 seedlings from the, the ones that were kept in pots for eight months. And then we just dug some wild, wildlings that is straight out of the forest and transferred them the next day. And then we planted about three and a half south thousand fruit too. So what we're doing is just comparing survivorship and, and uh, from the three different ways of doing it, work out which is cheapest and most efficient. So it's just, it's really a, a small trial to see what works. But uh, so you get, the top photo is the south side of the island and the bottom one is the north side. So we established two transects about 100 and something metres long on each side of the island. Then we removed, this is a pure stand of that uh, toxic tree I told you about. So we removed about every 10 or 15 metres one tree because I don't know if you can see in the background there, but those white spots are sunspots. So basically it's like 98% shading under that forest. And uh, seeds and seedlings just won't grow because it's, 100, it's, it's close to 100% shade. So you can see the little sunspots there. So we removed trees on the north, and above the transect a little bit to the north. Not too many, just to let some scattered light come through to get it down to about 75% shade rather than 99%. So, so we got rid of, we opened up the forest a little bit and then we got all the seedlings from the, from the uh, resort and from the, the village and we stuck them in the boats and we brought them across to Monoriki. This is in the Yanuya Island where the village is and that's Monoriki in the background. So it's a, they live about two kilometres away. The village is about two kilometres away. And then uh, unloaded them, and planted them along our transects. So that's the one of the fruit, that's the Falua fruit. I, I got Jabba to collect fruit for me uh, about a month before I got there and we dried them because most dry forest trees, the fruit stays in the soil for months and it's viable until it rains and then and then it, uh, it germinates. But uh, but nobody knows anything about Fiji and nobody's the Fiji's full of botanists, but I don't know what they do. So anyway, I found out that the seeds are only viable for three or four days after you pick them. I know I now now know that. So we had we had kilos of fruit from three or four weeks old, which I assume would grow, but they didn't. So the only ones that grew were the, the fresh ones we picked a day or two before we planted them, which is the top ones there, which look like you know fresh fresh fruit, yeah. So we're learning, but uh, so next time we won't bother with any uh, anything older, older than about a week, because uh, after a week their germination rate just dropped off. And we had uh, these transects, we put through the forest and we planted seeds every right along for a couple of hundred metres. So, so but the, the fresh fruit that we did plant, it, uh, it's coming up, that's a photo from Jabber, he sent me on his phone a few days ago. So. So they are, they are growing. So, so the thing is, we're going to wait. I'll go back end of this year again, see what percentage of, of the seedlings survive the dry season. Because dry seasons are quite long and, and can be very severe. So the, the first dry season will be the crux, whether you know what survive, whether the wildlings survive, the seedlings or the seeds. So, so the project is just really just a, it's just a trial to see which works the best. And uh, yeah, that's it. That's it. A short, a short history of Monoriki Island. So, any questions, please? And internationally, Wana Foundation funded it, and Houseway Resort put me up. So that was all very good. So, please, questions? Yes, any? Any chance of um, those animals that were Asian? Sorry, any the chance of the fetish? Have they uh, any chance there's any different species amongst those? Of iguanas? Yes, could we have missed another species? Well, you only ever get one species on any island. Yeah, I mean, that's what I mean by if yes. you have uh, lost some islands of species, could it have been another one? Oh, well, yeah, you, yeah. I've been working with this American guy, Robert Fisher, and he wants to, he wants to name every island a different a new species. But it's but every island is genetically different to the next island. It's true. You can differentiate them on the genetics these days, but you can do that for any for any subgroup of animals. So yeah, there's depending on what you want to call a species. Yes, you could you could name. I think you probably will, but I won't be covered with on those. I think you'll probably name 20 or 30 species in Fiji based on the data we've collected. Because but it's a big client, you know. That's 
it would have been one that initial immigration of brachiolophus type iguanas 26 million years ago, and they've, they've speciated into every island, and they're all every island is different. It's true. I mean, that, that photo I showed there, these guys are snap bent like this on one island, and the same species is twice as heavy on the next island, only twice as big. So yeah, but uh, yeah, there's there's huge diversity. There. There's more diversity in Fiji and iguanas than there is in the whole Caribbean, for sure. How many yeah. species do you think there are? Yeah, again, I'm happy with the four we have. Other, I mean, otherwise you can you can start splitting groups and yeah, yeah. I, I don't even know if the, the third one we, we, we described is really how valid it is. It's based on morphology and only a little bit of genetics, but not very much, yeah. So, yeah. Again, but, but every island's quite different. So, in, in morphology, genetics, yeah. But how many, that's... Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yes, Rick. You guys are just sort of living on one tree. How far are they moving to go by the reefs? I mean, are there magic sites on an island? Where no, they don't. No, they based. Well, we don't know exactly how far they, but they choose the deepest, shadiest, coldest places to lay their eggs under thick trees. Yeah. They don't. They certainly don't move to the egg laying areas. No. no. Which is what I was. That's what Gibbons was told. So all they all the they all moved to this area where it's open and sunny and that sounded that sounded good to me because that's what all the other iguanas do in well. And it's in the, in the new world, iguanas all go to these open, sunny areas to lay their eggs, but uh, but it's not true. In fact, no, I never met a Fijian who's ever seen uh, a hatchling or or egg laying or anything like that. Never. Even Peter the Ranger who I worked with for twenty years. He never seen a hatchling until I caught one and showed him. Because they don't go out at night. They're scared of the dark. They don't go out at night. <laughs> and you're not going to see hatchlings in the treetops in the daytime. He'd never seen one, so. Yeah. Yes? Do we have much in terms of fossil records on the island? I mean, obviously, they're not like. Yeah, fossils. Are there any fossils? I, there's some fossils in Fiji. There's there's two ex, there's uh, an extinct ground iguana in Fiji. Big guy. It's like a. It's, it's like a big ground iguana and it, it was eaten to extinction the like the weekend the first humans arrived 3,500 years ago and there was a big one in, in uh, Tonga too a big ground iguana in Tonga which was also eaten within like honestly within a year or two of humans arriving they ate them all yeah based on the sub fossil record in uh, fire pits and stuff yeah but no there's no lot there's no fo there's no like, long fossils just sub fossil records of, of people eating them yeah yeah, but Fiji also had uh, had, had uh, terrestrial crocodiles, uh, large terrestrial tortoises, and uh, and it had some huge it had some huge uh, pigeons, like pigeons, ground pigeons, but not flightless pigeons, bigger than dodos, bigger than dodos. The Fiji pigeon was, yeah, yeah, something like bigger than much bigger than a turkey. Yeah, but the, it had a really a really interesting fauna when the humans arrived, and they were just a big, had a giant frog, a rana, big frog. And today they got two small frogs, that's all. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's why the arboreal ones are left, because they're so hard to find. I mean, yeah, I mean, they're probably, they used to eat them for sure, but to actually eat all of them would have been just too hard. But I imagine that the terrestrial ones, a metre long or so, I imagine that they were fearless and like all island stuff, you know, you walk up and down them on the head. But even the, the, the uh, Fijini one, all the, all the Brachiolophus iguanas, if you see one on a, in a bush, if you walk up slowly, you can just walk up, pick it up, like that. If you run up, it'll run away. But if you walk up slowly, pick it up. And they'll just look at you, you know? They've got, they're completely fearless, yeah. <coughs> and that's probably just like a lot of island stuff, yeah. So even today, there, once you see them, they don't run away, unless you, unless you chase them and then they will harass them, yeah. Mm. Eddie, so rising sea levels affect anything there? Sorry? Did you rising sea level? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can't swim that well. No, but, <laughs> but Fiji's pretty good. It's, it's all old volcanoes. There's lots of... That island I'm working on is 150 metres high. And so it's, yeah, it's going to lose a lot, of, a lot of coastal stuff. But, uh, oh, it's only 62 metres of ice that left to, me, to melt. So, yeah, apparently sea levels, 62 metres will go up when all the ice is gone. But that's, so you know, if you're over 100 metres, you're going to have some land there. 
Introduced to where, sorry? To cast away. Oh, yeah, well, that's easy because I didn't talk about that, but there's an island just uh, 80 metres away from the south end of Castaway called Malola. And in 2002, somebody found an iguana there. And since then, we know that there's three populations on that island of about, well, two populations of around 100 and one of maybe 50. So there's already iguanas on, the, and those islands used to be connected. Uh, it's, only, it's only 30 metres of depth of water between them. So they would have been connected during the last ice age, and they would have had the same iguana on both. So, and it, what makes it simple is that the, the Fijian clan that owns Castaway also owned the land on, on the Malola Island with the iguanas. So we're dealing with the one clan, so that's easy. So yeah, so, that's, so I would introduce them from the, the island right next door. Yeah, but there's only maybe 200, 250 maximum on that island. And they're both in resorts. They're in resort gardens because resorts grow ornamental stuff like uh, hibiscus and uh, a whole bunch of ornamental stuff that iguanas eat because there's no forest on that island. It's all grass and, and uh, bye bye, which is a Central American shrub, bush. Yeah. So the, the iguanas, strangely enough, they exist in, in resorts only on that island. Yeah. Yes, please. For the uh, 21 individuals you captured the uh, breeding program, yeah. there, what sort of diets did you go Did you go solely from uh, the native stuff that's there, or did you introduce any of the hibiscus and stuff that they Yeah, they, the, the, the little fauna park that had it, they, they made up their own diet, which was uh, lots of tell you the exact diet, I've got it written down somewhere, but it was in, involved uh, lots of green veggies they bought from New Zealand, because they can't, you can't buy the lettuce in, in uh, Fiji and stuff like that, and they fed them hibiscus leaves like every day, but then they gave them this chopped up salad three days a week as well. They actually gave them eggs too, occasionally for half a of them, which I didn't know about until recently. Mm. <laughs> so they had their protein there, I guess. But uh, yeah, they gave them mostly hibiscus leaves because that grows the native hibiscus, the Pacific hibiscus. Yeah, yeah. But they also gave them a salad of chopped up lettuce and I don't know some sort of and a whole bunch of greens. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry, and uh, grated grated carrot and grated uh, sweet potato. Mm. Yeah. Do you think that had something to do with their survival rate out in um, back at the log? No, I. Didn't touch on that, but Monoriki Island, about two less than two percent of the trees are, are species that iguanas can eat, and so I think there's just not enough food on that island to keep more than 50 or 100 iguanas going. And once an iguana finds a tree that it can eat, it stays there. I think. It, it, whereas on Yondo Tumba they can move around because every second tree is edible, whereas only like one in 20 is edible on Monoriki. Yeah. So no, I think I think mostly they starved. They couldn't find any edible trees. And the people who released them, I wasn't involved in the release, but uh, they didn't know which tree to put them on, so they put them on any tree. And then the, and then the ones with transmitters, some of them went three, 400 metres to find a tree it could eat. And, so, and some of them lost 20, 30% weight in the first month. But that was badly done too. So we don't have good, yeah, we don't have good uh, data on that. But a lot of them, I think a lot of them starved to death during that first dry season, yeah. That's my guess. But there's still maybe 80 or 100 on that island. Yeah, most of them were. Some were the, were, some were the captive bred ones and some were the, uh, the ones that had always been there and escaped, had never been caught. Yeah. That's it. Yes. Yep. Uh, so if you, oh, sorry. Oh, if you uh, in, introduced um, the iguana to another island, say, if if there is two different species in one island, would they crossbreed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, I think all of the brachiolophus would probably crossbreed with each other. So Certainly in captivity they will, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but after the crossbreed, like, how do you decide this? Well, we wouldn't introduce them to an island if there was already a species there. Right. No, no one would do that, yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, uh, 
the only islands we will introduce them to are islands that had historic records, but no longer, but they're no longer there. Like after we remove cats, then we could put put them back yep. from another and closely fired island. Yeah. 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 Sorry, behind you. Uh, yep. So for my camera, you mentioned like there's like one three project overall. So ever any, any plans like organize a number one would be knowledge we have at this point, or just saying would be one we've got. Uh, so if we want to get over like one breeding program, is that still going on or? No, no, sorry, that's, we fin that's finished in 2017. And we re released all the juveniles and the, uh, and the, the founders as well. That many are. are there any plans like organized number one with Mark? Uh, uh, no, it won't happen again because that particular uh, place is now being sold to somebody else. There's no one in the gear that look after it, for sure. We wouldn't want to do it in another country, I don't think. So quarantine, lots of reasons. Yeah. And I don't think happy free you know, is necessarily the best way to go anyway, personally. But in that case, it seemed appropriate because the, they, the uh, people who own the island were, were, were not about to take the goats off it and let it recover. And then as soon as we got the iguanas into activity, the, the old chief died and the new chief then, oh yeah, that's a good idea, we should do that. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's the same chief thing, so Yes, sir. Some of our very spectrum of more populations, Tonga and Vanuatu, or whatever, are they still going? Yeah. Apparently they are. There's only the one in Vanuatu, yeah, yeah. in one island. Yeah, you know, the story is, uh, in the 1960s, they were, well, there was no internet, there was no sightings, you could just take the visit and sell them around the world. And a German, reptile dealer moved to Fiji and started selling lizards into the pet market all over the world, iguanas. He was collecting them from mostly Kondavu and, uh, and Overlay, which are the two big ones in the year. And they got the pretty ones, the four dollar. And anyway, then somewhere in the late 60s, the mid 60s, they became protected and the international trade said, no, you need permits. And so he moved to Vanuatu with his stock. And then it got too hot for him in Vanuatu. He was only there a year and he let him go and left. So, yeah, that's the story. So, he, he, he moved his whole business of reptile dealing to Vanuatu. And he took his big eating with him. Yeah. And all the ones there out there are actually descended from Mon from uh, Overlay and Kondapa because we've done the gen genetic problem. And they're, all, they're a mix of those two islands. We did two islands when I went there in the 70s. Everyone said, oh, I'll go to. Come down, we will go to Overlau, that's where there's tons of big ones. And that's where they always traditionally got it from. Yeah, yeah so they're a hybrid one. And they're still around, yeah. I hear people going on cruises and they try to sell you one on the water still. Mm -hmm. Yeah, only last year someone told me that. So and there it's a creek, there's a village and a creek and they and they're only found about a kilometre up that creek. They haven't spread, apparently. That's what I hear. So there's this creek village and the creek runs along the side of it and you'll find them at night along the banks uh, in the trees along the creek. That's what I've been told. And they don't go more than they haven't spread at all to the next to the next part of the room. Interesting. Yeah, so you can go there and get your feral population. Thank you. Thank you.